So God has a specific assignment. He's got a specific assignment for you and for me. Sometimes we look at our circumstances, we look at the consequences that sometimes come from a choice that we've made and we wonder, man, did I miss that assignment that he had for me? Oh, man. So if this is something that you have, if if it's a familiar sound that you've heard the enemy whisper into your ear that, man, I have blown my assignment, just like some of these pictures on the screen, I've blown my assignment, then I believe that this message is going to be an encouragement for you. And for me, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, uh, I believe that God wants to use us and he chooses to use us. And that's where we're going this morning. So I know that I'm not alone when I identify with some of the pictures, the funny, silly pictures that we saw up here. I can't count how many times that I have uh, had a specific assignment in my life and then I've blown it. Or I feel like I've blown it, whether it's in athletics or uh, school. I've failed plenty of assignments. Uh, I don't know about you, but in my assignments and role as a husband, as a father, as a son, uh, as a pastor, I've, I've blown some assignments. And I know that I'm not alone. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or anything, but... Uh, Anyway, I know that that happens to all of us. But I read something recently, and I'm sorry to say that it's probably for the first time. But I read something recently, and I want you to read it with me this morning. So I want to read the setup, the backstory that's found in Matthew's gospel about the Christmas Christmas account. And I want to read from Matthew 1, verse 1 through 16. Don't panic. It's going to be right up here on the screen. I'm reading from the NIV translation this morning. Are you ready? All right. Let's stick it up there. This is the genealogy of Jesus. With me. I want you to read it with me. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David. Okay, you guys, you're falling behind. You're falling behind. That's okay. There is grace here. I'll read it. You just follow along. But how many of you, when you, when you read the word genealogy, do you say, let me just skip over that part? I just want to get to the meaty part. So in Caneo, they scolded us for skipping over those parts, right? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scriptures God breathed. Is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. So what? The man of God may be equipped for every good work. So even these genealogies, they fit under that category of all. So we're not going to skip it today. But I will have mercy because I have practiced some of these names over and over this week. So just read them along with me. You don't need to read it out loud. You can if you want to, but try to keep up. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah, and his brothers, Judah the father of, uh, sorry, see I told you, Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of King David, David the father of Solomon, whose mother was Uriah's wife, her name Bathsheba, as you recall, Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. We're about halfway through. (laughs) Stay with me. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile of Babylon, 
Jeconia was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. Abihud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Elihud. We're almost there. Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. Mathan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. This is exciting stuff. I can tell, I can tell you guys are on pins and needles wondering, what am I going to do with this genealogy? So just imagine yourself, though, if you were looking back through your lineage and you saw some of these huge biblical names. Just imagine, it would be exciting for you. If you saw names like Abraham, 4,000 years ago, God said, I choose you, Abraham. You're going to go, you're going to be the father of an enormous nation. Now leave your home and go to the place I'll show you. You're the one person in all the world through whom that I'm going to bless humanity. So by faith, Abraham went and God led him to the land of promise. And then there's Jacob. You know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So Jacob, that's Abraham's grandson. He was renamed Israel. He had 12 sons. They established the first 12 tribes, the only 12 tribes of Israel. So actually, Abraham actually wrestled, sorry, Jacob actually wrestled with God. And he got his blessing. He paid for it. He limped for the rest of his life, but he paid for it. He wrestled with God. And we've got David, 3,000 years ago, second king of Israel, psalm writer, bear killer, lion killer, giant killer, the shepherd king. Man after God's own heart, Solomon, David's son, the third legitimate king of Israel, wisest, probably the richest man in all of history. Eat your heart out, Elon Musk. (laughs) Temple builder. Then we've got Hezekiah, a little bit less known, but Hezekiah, 2,700 years ago, 13th king of Judah, reigned for 29 years from the age of 25. He did what was said, it says that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, like his ancestor David did. In fact, God gave him an extra 15 years as an answer to prayer. This would be pretty exciting stuff if it was our, if it was our lineage. Even more significantly, this lineage that I read all leads to one place, our Messiah. What we have here is the lineage of our Jesus. It's our Lord and Savior. These are the people that God chose to use to bring his son into the world so that he could reestablish relationship with you and with me. That's exciting stuff. So I don't want to glance over these names. Also, when I look at this long list of names, and th- which includes some of those old heroes, those Old Testament heroes that we've heard stories and we've told stories in Sunday school and, and listened to over and over. I, I recognize some other names. We'll get to that in just a second. But I have some of those biblical names in my lineage too. The last time I spoke, uh, I told you about a heritage that I feel like I have in my past of Mangums and Wilsons in in my past that made some huge biblical moves, godlike, faith-filled moves. I'd like to tell you about a couple of them just now. I had a grandfather whose name was Thomas Grady Mangum I, the OG. There's four or five of them now, uh, but he was the original. Thomas Grady Uh, served the Lord faithfully, uh, and he was actually on his deathbed, very sick, and uh, had a vision that he he went to heaven. And this is a true story, that he had a vision that he went to heaven, he saw the splendor and the magnificence of all that was there, and it took his breath away. And in his vision, he saw Jesus, and he met with Jesus, and he talked with Jesus, and Jesus said, all of this is yours. However, I have an assignment for you. I have an assignment for you for the next 10 years, and then you can come back. So kicking and screaming, T.G. Mangum got healed. 
and he served for another 10 years. And it was 10 years. I don't know about to the day, but it was 10 years, and then he died of a heart attack. And then he got his reward. And then I know I told you the story of my grandma, who, or you've heard the story of my grandma, who, uh, when she was young, she had typhoid, paratyphoid fever, died, actually died, the sheet over her head. Uh, and hours and hours later, she was resurrected, and she wanted ice cream. I have another great-grandfather who uh, was a pioneering missionary to the Arab lands. He was one of the first Christian missionary alliances, the denomination that I grew up in. One of the first alliance missionaries over to the Arab lands, and he moved uh, his little family. He had a very successful lineage, a uh, very successful business that he left uh, to obey the Lord and his calling. So he moved overseas and spent there over 40 years there uh, in the Middle East. And then my same grandma that passed away and her husband, who is T.G. the second, not the O.G., but the second, T.G. and grandma, they went to uh, um, Vietnam or uh, Southeast Asia in that, in that area for over 20 years. Big God, God-like faith-filled moves. And that's not to mention even my parents that have served God faithfully overseas, and they've served God in uh, church, uh, churches all around the United States, faithfully serving in what God has called them to do. Beautiful. My brother, my sister, their families both serving the Lord. My brother spends most of his time in Germany. He's a field director for the denomination that he works in, and uh, lives most of the time in Germany as the field director for over the missionaries there in Germany. My, my sister works in a, uh, in a ministry, and brother-in-law, they work in a ministry in Texas that they bring refugees over, and they help resettle them and get them um, clothing and apartments and driver's licenses and uh, all those things, the hands and feet of God, all throughout my lineage. It's very humbling. I'm very honored to be a part of that lineage. But also when I look at those names that are in that lineage of Messiah, I see some names that maybe aren't as familiar. I notice names like Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba. For just a few minutes, I want to remind us of their stories and then draw some conclusions of what we see these remarkable women that are mentioned in Jesus' ancestry. Listen, the very fact that they're mentioned should capture our imagination, or our attention, rather. So first, there's Tamar. This is kind of a hard story to tell. Her story is found in Genesis 38. It's actually one of the more bizarre stories that I've ever read in Scripture. So you remember Judah. Judah is one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Uh, and so Judah's on the list, and he had three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. So Ur got older, and Judah found a Canaanite, non-Jewish wife for him. But according to scripture, Ur was an evil man, and God killed him, put him to death. So then there was a custom that the father would then uh, tell the next son that it was his responsibility, Onan is the next son, that it was his responsibility to give his brother an heir so that his name could be carried on. So Onan, Onan married her and uh, married Tamar, and lo and behold, he was evil too. God killed him, put him to death. So Judah told his daughter-in-law, Tamar, you go back to your family, you live as a widow, and then when Shayla gets old enough, I'll be in touch. But he didn't have any intention of being in touch with her. He wanted to forget her because he was afraid that it was going to kill Shayla also. So he had no intention uh, of letting him get close to her. Well, time passed and Tamar was forgotten. Then eventually Judah's wife died. And through another set of very bizarre and not so PG rated circumstances happened and Judah ended up fathering 
his daughter-in-law's twin boys, Perez and Zira. Perez being the next in Jesus's lineage. So it's like, it's like God looked down and said, Tamar, no one is so forgotten and, and so obscure that they can't be remembered and used by me in a most special way to accomplish my divine and eternal purpose. Tamar, you are in the lineage of Messiah. Rahab's number two on my list. Rahab's story is found in Joshua 2. Uh, if you are not familiar with it, you can go and read it. I'll tell it to you just as a uh, Cliff Notes version. So Salmon was on the list. I'm not sure if that's exactly how you say it, but he was identified by his shiny, scaly skin and his desire to go against the flow. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Few of you got that. That was good. I worked very hard on that one. <laughs> he was actually identified as the husband of a man of a woman named Rahab, who was also listed. And they were the parents of Boaz. We're going to learn about Boaz in the next story, but I want to focus right now on Rahab. So uh, we don't know the story of how they got together, but we do know it kind of centered around the fact that she was a lady of the night. She was a prostitute. And uh, in this large, walled off, uh, fortified city of Jericho. And it was just across the river from the Jordan where Joshua, the new leader of the Israelites, right? Moses uh, had passed away and they were getting ready to conquer. You remember this story. Uh, so Josh was over there with about 2 million Israelites getting ready to go and claim what God had promised them, that land that God had promised them. So he was strategizing and he sent two spies over to learn about the city, see if there was any weaknesses, see what they could learn about the people that lived there. And as it turns out in God's providence, Rahab actually hosted the spies and then hid them from the search and then coached them and helped them back out of the city. And for her help, she and her family were promised and given lifelong protection. It's like God said, Rahab, no one is so sinful and shameful that they cannot be forgiven and used by me in a most special way to fulfill my divine eternal purpose. Rahab, you're in the lineage of Messiah. Then there's Ruth. Her story is found where? Ruth, very good. She's got a book that bears her name. In contrast over the other two women that I've talked about already, Ruth's story is one of the sweetest in all of scripture. It's one of the best rom-com Hallmark movies that you would ever watch if they actually made one. I know Tanya likes those things. It starts with a Jewish man by the name of Elimelech. Elimelech and his wife Naomi, they had two sons. They were living in Bethlehem and they wanted to move away from Bethlehem, so they moved to Moab. Moab was just a little bit south, a little bit east of Bethlehem, other side of, or on the coast of the Dead Sea. So they moved to Moab. And then after a little while later, Elimelech died. Naomi, heartbroken. A few years goes by, and her two, it's just her and her two sons. Her two sons meet local Moabite girls, and they marry them. And then about 10 years later, we don't know why, but about 10 years later, those boys die. So it's just Naomi and then her two stepdaughters. Heartbroken. She doesn't know what to do. She just decides, did I say something wrong? Sorry, what did I say? Sorry. Yeah, daughter-in-laws. I heard some murmuring. <laughs> Blown assignment. So... Uh, it's just her and her two daughter-in-laws. Heartbroken, she wants to go back home 
to Bethlehem to be near her family. She tells her daughter-in-laws, y'all go back home and just start over. I'm so sorry, just start over. One of them did, Ruth did not. We have her amazing declaration that came in the form of song by Chris Tomlin, where you go, I'll go, where you stay. You guys remember that song? Well, he plagiarized. It's right here. She says to Naomi, do not urge me to leave you and turn my back from you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. So now, there's two widows kicking it around in Bethlehem. Naomi and her Moabite daughter-in-law. Ruth, Naomi's family had some sense of duty to take care of her, but certainly not to this outsider, this foreigner, uh, this non-Jewish girl. So, but it turns out Ruth was so dedicated and committed that she had committed to taking care of her mother-in-law and support her mother-in-law and gather food for her mother-in-law. And word got out about this little Moabite girl that was taking care of her Uh, of Naomi, the the local um, hometown girl, Naomi. Uh, The only way that Ruth had of providing any food for the two of them was to go glean the wheat. If you don't know what gleaning is, it just means to pick up the wheat that had fallen as the harvesters were picking, collecting some of it inevitably fell off to the side. Well, Ruth would go and collect uh, the fallen wheat. And then Boaz enters the scene. You remember Boaz? He's the son of Rahab and Salmon, right? So uh, she was saved. She was promised salvation. Rahab, I'm talking about, promised uh, safety. And now Boaz, their son, is this prominent, respected landowner in Bethlehem. Uh, And it just so happens that Ruth is gleaning on one of Boaz's fields. And Boaz sees her and says to his harvesters, hey, let's leave a bunch of wheat out there on the ground. So that way they have plenty. I mean, these are widows. uh, She's so sweet to take care of her mother-in-law. Let's leave it for them. And then long story short, you'll have to read it yourself, but long story short, uh, Boaz takes Ruth to be his husband, wife. I even thought about that one. You guys are so gracious. So Boaz took Ruth to be his wife and Ruth gave birth to a son, named him Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who had eight sons and the youngest of them was David. That's right. So we're drawing these lines. And all good lines. It's like God said, Ruth, no one is so poor or displaced or dependent that they can't be elevated and used by me in a most special way to achieve my divine eternal purpose. Ruth, you're in the lineage of Messiah. And then we have Bathsheba. It's the familiar King David story about the wife of a dedicated and courageous Hittite soldier originally from Assyria. His name is Uriah, and he served in David's army. He was actually cited as being one of David's mighty men. So while Uriah was away fighting the Ammonites and King David, who should have been out there leading his army was getting some fresh air on his roof, and he saw something that he liked. Bathsheba was bathing, so he sent for her. Now, in those days, and I'm assuming even now, nobody has really the prerogative to reject the king. So she had no option but to go. 
So not long after that visit, Bathsheba found herself to be pregnant with the king's child. David's solution was to give Uriah leave. He would come home, he would be with his wife, and then nobody would be the wiser. Even him, they would, they would all think that the child that she was pregnant with would be uh, the, Uriah the father's. No, somebody's helping me over here. That's good. So, uh, yeah, so they, uh, he brings Uriah home. Uriah doesn't want any of the creature comforts that his brothers in arms aren't getting. So he stays out on the porch and doesn't touch her. So plan A doesn't work. Plan B, let's send him to the front lines. That way he can be killed and then he'll take her into his harem. Um, so plan B works. Uh, he took Bathsheba into his harem. Of course, you know the story that when the prophet Nathan confronted David, David confessed and repented of his sin. It's like God, it's like God said, Bathsheba, nobody is so victimized or abused or manipulated that they can't be healed and vindicated and used by me in a most special way to fulfill my divine and eternal purpose. Bathsheba, you're in the lineage of Messiah. The last name on that list, besides Jesus, is Mary. And finally, the 13-year-old Mary, mother of Jesus. We know her story very well. That's, this, that's the season we're in. I need to move this away. So Luke 1, 26 through 38 tells us part of that story. She might have been a year or two older than 13, but probably not. And when Gabriel told her what God was requiring of her, she said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. How many 13-year-olds do that? I know mine didn't. Anyway, Luke 1, 46 through 55 tells us that she started to worship. It's called Mary's song. I'm just going to read it to you. This is what she says. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm and has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from the thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. I think for us here today, one of the things that it does is it proves that nobody is too weak or too young or too vulnerable to be chosen and emboldened and used by God in a most special way to fulfill his divine, eternal purpose. Mary, you're in the lineage of Messiah, the Savior. In fact, you're the one who will deliver him to, into the world. I have an extra biblical account that kind of fits into the category of these, of these women that I'd like to tell you about this morning as we land this plane. I know we're a little early, but uh, if the worship team uh, could come up and play just for a bit before we have an opportunity to respond this morning. My grandfather, my mom's daddy, was born Ernest Montgomery. When my grandpa was three years old, his father, my biological great-grandfather, was 
found caught uh, in the bathroom abusing and molesting my grandfather when he was when my grandfather was three years old so my biological great-grandmother kicked that monster out of the house uh, I don't know what ever happened to him uh, it doesn't matter to my story uh, but then she was left to raise the four kids that she had by herself. And this is 100 years ago. So probably not all the resources that we have these days. So one of the things that she did to try to support her family was she played the organ at the silent motion picture show. Some of you don't know what that is. And that's okay. You can Google it. Or ask Siri. Anyway, she was playing the organ at the motion picture show. When she, uh, one evening when she was done playing, she was leaving her post and she had to go down a spiral staircase. And as she was walking down the spiral staircase, her foot caught in the stairs and she fell. But she didn't fall all the way to the ground. She fell and she hung there. And she hung there and she hung there and she hung there for hours and hours and their insides were all torn up. And when they finally found her, she was dead. 26 years old. So now there's four orphans. My grandfather and his three siblings. So then they go to the orphanage and they split them apart because it's a little bit easier to get them adopted if they're separated. So they separated my, my grandfather and his siblings until one day a man from the Ford Motor Company came to the orphanage and took my grandfather home. His name was Gerald Wilson. When he got him home, Gerald Wilson's wife, who's used to running in some high society, I mean, they were Ford Motor Company, that was a big deal, found that my grandfather had a fungus on his head and she felt like he was dirty. So she made Gerald take him back to the orphanage, didn't want him. Until a little while later, Gerald couldn't stand the thought of Ernest being there at the orphanage. So he went and he rescued him. He went back to the orphanage and he rescued my grandfather. And then he changed his name. My grandfather died, Ernest Gerald Wilson. He gave him a new lineage, not the one that had to do with the, the monster that had uh, wrecked him in the first place. And he took the name of Orphan off of him. And he put him in a family that had a new lineage. And then he met Jesus. My grandfather met Jesus when he was 16 in a tent meeting. And then he got an even newer, better lineage. Amen? The one that's offered to us here. The one that's offered to us today. He got a new lineage and a new divine purpose. He went on to preach. My grandfather went on to preach for the rest of his life. And he's the one that actually led me to the Lord when I was just a little boy. I remember it was upstairs in his library in North Caldwell, New Jersey. Uh, it was in the church parsonage, the house that was connected to the church that he was a pastor of. I was three years old. But I know that I am just a tiny representation of his ministry that the ministry that he did for the Lord and his kingdom, I'm just a drop in the pond. Those ripples around my grandfather's ministry go far beyond me. The ministry and the reconciliation that God did through my grandpa Wilson and then the rest of my lineage on both sides is eternal. Eternal impact. According to every song we sing, 
He will reign forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. He'll reign forever and ever. So that impact is eternal. Everlasting impact. So maybe you are a strong leader. Maybe you are a spiritual giant. Maybe you're even somebody who is considered very wise and highly gifted. Or maybe you're like the rest of us. And you're someone who has been forgotten and abandoned. Maybe you're someone who has lived far from God and his ways. Maybe you feel displaced and poor and dependent. Maybe you feel victimized, manipulated, abused. Maybe you're very young. Maybe you're vulnerable. I believe the message to us this morning that it's not about any of that stuff. It's not about our insecurities. It's not about the choices that we've made in the past. It never has been about any of that. It's always been about God. And the fact that he wants to use every one of us, weak and strong, he wants to use the vulnerable and the powerful. He wants to use the rich and the poor. You and me. In fact, he takes the most pleasure, I think, and receives the most honor and glory when he uses the lowly things, the weak things, instead of the strong. It gives him more glory that way. So I'm going to read in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, it says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not the non-existent things, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That's our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. First Samuel chapter 12 it says for the sake of his great name the Lord will not reject his people because the Lord was pleased to make you his own he was pleased to put his name on you he's pleased to put his brand on your heart but be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart consider like Mary did, what great things he has done for you. The message, I believe, of this Christmas is that we are all on assignment. It's as true today as it has always been. For Abraham, for Isaac, for Jacob, for David, or Bathsheba, or Rahab, or Tamar, or Ruth, or Mary. God wants to use you and he's got a new name for you. 
he has a redeemed lineage and a divine purpose if you'll say yes to him. So we're going to give an opportunity to respond this morning. Our prayer team will be up here ready to serve and minister to you. And I'm just going to pray. Father, you are the same God. That song has just been echoing all day. And you want to redeem the broken things. You want to redeem the lost things. You want to redeem the lowly things. So that they bring you glory, God. Father, I believe that you have our yes right now. I believe that you are calling some as your very own right now. I pray for strength and courage for those who feel less than at times. That feel like they don't measure up to the divine assignment that they feel like you had for them. I pray that you would erase the lies the old names that the enemy has called us in the past. And I pray that we would be ready to receive your brand on our hearts this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And for his glory, amen.